welcome. My name is Matt Rabel, and I am a Java hipster. <laughs> so one of the things I like to do is there's some processes with jhipster that take a little while, so I like to actually start those right before we get going here. So I, you won't see it, but I'll show you the command later. So let's uh, go into here. And what I'm typing is jhipster jdl reactive ms. So that's going to kick off a process that generates a whole microservices architecture. And we'll come back to that, you know, the demo time. So this presentation is based on a blog post that I wrote. And it's been, you know, a year since I wrote it. But the cool thing is all the code in it still works with the latest jhipster. And it's called Reactive Java Microservices. And you notice that microservices font is a little funny there. It's called Pacifico. Well, that's the uh, font that we chose for jhipster. So if you go to jhipster.tech, you'll see we use a similar font there. And you might be asking yourself, well, what is jhipster? Well, it started out as just a Spring and Angular JS generator. So that's how old it is. It wasn't even Spring Boot. It was Angular JS and Spring at the time. We added Spring Boot when it came out in 2014, and then you know added Angular 2 and Angular 3, and now we just call it Angular. And now we have React and Vue as well. And it's kind of like a choose your own adventure book, right? You get to choose the technologies you want to use, and then it generates an app or a microservices architecture for you. And so how to get started, you install it with NPM. And you as Java developers might be like, hey, I thought we didn't have to use NPM, right? So there is other ways to do it, just like you have start.spring.io. We have start.jhipster.tech, so you can do the same process through a browser. You'll create a directory and CD into it. So one of the coolest things you might learn today is the take command, right? It creates a directory and CDs into it, so pretty handy. And then you run jhipster, and it basically prompts you for a bunch of questions. So let's go ahead and see what that looks like. We got this one going here. I got to mirror my screens, just because that graphic isn't that great. So I'm going to... Go ahead and the new M1 doesn't make it so easy to mirror stuff. Uh, so we'll go ahead and take that and go back a level and then bump up the fonts. And so if you run jhipster, the first mistake you'll make is it'll generate all the files in the current directory. So as a Java developer, you're used to creating a project, and it creates a directory, and then puts all the project files in it, right? But it doesn't work that way with this JavaScript stuff. So beware of that, right? That's the first thing. So if you'll see, it prompts me down here at the bottom for the type of application. You can use a monolith. You can choose a gateway. Or you can choose a microservice application. If you're doing a gateway, it actually uses Spring Cloud Gateway. I'm just going to do a monolith. Prompts you for the name. You'll notice there it gives you the indication you're in the wrong directory, right? Downloads trying to put in my downloads directory, right? But I don't really care. I'll just say, you know, Spring I.O. And then what do you want to make it reactive, right? You can do reactive. We'll go ahead and say yes. And then default package name, we'll just accept the default. What type of authentication, JWT, OAuth, or HTTP session? I'll just use the default, JWT, SQL, Mongo, right? No SQL. You can also use Neo4j or even no database. And then what production database would you like to use? Uh, which development database, Maven or Gradle. You don't want to use the jhipster registry. Elasticsearch, Apache Kafka, right? It's got all that in there. Which framework, Angular, React, or Vue. Do you want to generate the admin UI? And do you want to use the boot swatch theme, right? And then do you want internationalization? And it's got a bunch of languages in there. I think we're up to 20. And then Cypress, Protractor, Gatling, or Cucumber for testing frameworks. So that's a better way to look at it, right? Because it's easier to see. And then we'll go back to our presentation here. And you know, here's all the different various options. What? Why doesn't that match this? There we go. OK. So you know, I went through all those. And you can see it's got a, a plethora of options. As you can imagine, it's tough to maintain that. So as like a sustainable project, are we very green? I like to think so, but we're using so many GitHub Actions that I think if we actually had to pay for them to test all this, it might be a very expensive project. So like I said, we have start.jhipster.tech, which allows you to actually create everything online. The cool thing about this is you can download. You know, you make all those same choices. You can download the app, or you can actually just go ahead and export it to like GitHub or GitLab. Right? And then it's on your GitHub repo, and everything works from there. And you could even hook up something like Heroku and take it straight from there 
to the actual you know, production. So I wanted to do that demo. I haven't done it yet, but I think it would be cool that you never had to do anything locally right, to get it all the way to production. So it's a thriving open source project created by Julian Dubois. Oh, we lost the mic. Well, it depends on where I go. Does it work over here? Works over there. All right. If I back up too much, it might not work. All right. Well, October 21st, 2013, so I don't know if you remember, Spring Boot 1.0 came out April 1st, 2014, right? On April Fool's Day, in the U.S. anyway, so it's, you know, a risky uh, time to release a project. We did, and Google did Gmail on the same date. I don't remember which year, but uh, it seems to be a popular thing that, you know, April 1st. So it's an app generator, a platform, a learning tool. Oh, and I forgot to introduce myself. My name is Matt Rabel. I'm Hick from the Sticks. I grew up in the backwoods of Montana with no electricity, no running water, and I did have to walk two miles to the bus stop every day. But the cool thing is in the winter, we would ski. So I have a lot of skiing hours in, right? I used to ski to the bus stop. So I work at a company called Okta. My dad calls it Okra, and uh, I think he calls it Okta now, so he's still not quite there on, on naming it correctly. But we do have an office here in Barcelona. I went into it yesterday. There's OS0 and Okta have a joint office, so that's pretty neat. And uh, this is the cabin I grew up in. My great-grandfather built it and uh, grew up there, yeah, 16 years. It was quite the uh, experience. I live in Denver, Colorado with my beautiful wife, Trish, and two awesome kids. You can tell this, this photo is a bit dated because the youngest boy there is now six inches taller than me, right? So he's grown up. And I have a middle child, his name is Hefe. So you could call him El Hefe if you wanted, but uh, you know, I named him after, he's German, so Hefeweizen, right? He's a 66 bus that I bought off eBay in 2004. It took 12 years to make him look like this, so if you have a similar expensive obsession with cars like I do, I'd love to talk to you afterwards. <laughs> if you want to learn more about Okta, developer.okta.com. So just to give you a brief history of spring, I'm sure you're familiar with it, but you know, October 2002 is when Rod Johnson first wrote J2EE design and development. And for most people, you know, if they were using EJBs, they were like, oh my, this looks like a much easier way to do things. And for me, I was one of those developers that never did EJB, right? So I was like, oh, maybe I can be an enterprise developer now and I'll just use Spring for that. And so 2004, Spring 1.0 came out. And you know what else came out? In, uh, in that year, it's so crazy. In that same like time span, it was JSF 1.0, which did okay, right? And Flex 1.0, which didn't do okay, right? So it's kind of funny to look back on that time. And Ajax wasn't even a thing yet, right? I think Ajax might have been invented shortly before that, but very interesting time for Spring. And then 2006 came out, you know, Spring 2.0 with better XML support, right? Now we had schemas. And I remember when I first converted from like Java EE or J2E security at the And now we got a little mic issue again. Huh? And, uh, and there used to be just pages of XML, right? And so it was like a CG security is better, but oh my, the configuration, right? And so I think it was around 2009, 2010, where Spring actually wasn't as popular anymore. People started to like look at it as it's got XML hell kind of thing. And you know, a CG was part of that, but they invented Java config to like combat that, right? And for the most part, developers didn't use it, right? They could, but they still had their XML files and they didn't know how to convert them. And that's when Spring Boot really came along and like put a shot in the arm, right? Where it was like, hey, you don't have to use any configuration, we'll just configure it for you. And then the next year, a year later, Spring Cloud. And that's what really gave the rise to microservices, in my opinion, in the Java space. And I just have to uh, grab my speaker notes here because I'm sure I'm missing some cool things that I forgot to mention. So we'll put that over there. And then we'll play this. All right. So there was a number of microservice visionaries. Uh, this is James Lewis on the left here. There's Martin Fowler on the right and Adrian Cockcroft and Joe Wallen. So. Those guys get a lot of credit for microservices, but the term microservices goes all the way back to like 2006 or seven. And it was the similar concept, and it was, you know, do one thing and do it well, just like, you know, Unix does things, right? 
And, uh, and so James Lewis presented some of his ideas in March 2012 at 33 Degree Conference in Krakow, and his talk was called Microservices, the Java Way. And then Fred George is another guy who had similar ideas with him at the time, and Adrian Cockroft, who was at Netflix, described the architecture as fine grain SOA, right? And he pioneered like the style of, of taking microservices and making them web scale at Netflix, as did Joe and, and Dan North and Evan Botcher and Graham Crackley. And then it was really, in my opinion, like a big boon when Martin Fowler and James Lewis published an article simply titled Microservices, right? That was March 25th, 2014. So it was like a week before spring boot 1.0 came out, right? And then Spring Cloud a year later. So in my opinion, like a lot of this stuff in the Java ecosystem started happening at that time. So one of the things they mentioned in that article is Conway's Law. And Conway's Law is very much saying that if your organization has departments of people and that's how you communicate, and you have maybe departments of developers, DBAs and you know front-end developers and maybe someone that does operations, like it's gonna be tough for you to do microservices because Microservices really work well if everyone can work on something as a team, right? All the way from developing it to coming up with the idea to putting it in production to monitoring it. So if your organization doesn't have the ability for you to work as a team and have like one or two of those people on your team, then like good luck doing microservices. You might just want to stick with monoliths, right? Most companies do and most companies really don't have a problem with scaling monoliths because for the most part, Microservices is for scaling teams and people, not technology. When I worked at LinkedIn in 2007 and 8, we actually had a monolith and it worked great, but we only deployed once a week. And so they wanted to start deploying, you know, once a day. And so that's where it became a problem because they wanted to hire a lot more people. So again, you know, microservices is do one thing and do it well. And uh, it's easier to do one small thing, right, in a microservice. The problem is, you know, how do you segment your microservices, right? Is it, is it a store and it just has store information in there, right, if you're doing an online store? Or should it be, you know, more fine grain where it's just a product, right, in that store? And so I think a lot of teams struggle with that. For your company, what I would suggest is if you're moving to microservices, you know, the most important thing is to try and get started and then try to have loose coupling between your microservices. But the beauty of the whole architecture style is you can do it in a monolith. And so the main way of doing it is you pass messages instead of calling like methods directly, right? So if you have some sort of async messaging in your actual application, then you can do it in a monolith. It doesn't have to be microservices. So Spring Boot obviously does Java very well, right? In my opinion, it's a brilliant logo because it's like an on-off switch, right? And for me, it's like the on-off switch of Enterprise Java because I was never a huge fan of J2EE. I did use it and I did use Java EE, but I mostly use like the servlet parts, right? Maybe JMS or something like that, but EJBs were kind of like, eh, I don't really need those. And I didn't need to do much distributed stuff, right? So the beauty of Spring Boot is it automatically configures everything and Spring whenever possible you know, production ready features with metrics and health checks and externalized configuration. And I even used it on a project once back in 2015 where the only thing the client wanted was externalized configuration, right? They were already using Spring. And I think it took me like a day to convert from Spring to Spring Boot just to get that externalized configuration feature. And then it was very revolutionary, like not so revolutionary at the time, but uh, when it embedded, right, Tomcat, Jetty, or Undertow, like, Drop Wizard was kind of doing that before, but people were like, that's cool. And it wasn't until Spring Boot where they were like, oh, that's awesome. Right, as Josh says, make jar, not war. Right, and once you have that jar, you can start it up and do whatever you want. So it's very opinionated, right? It's got pre-configured starter palms and you know, Maven and Gradle and DevTools. DevTools is a, a really cool feature. Uh, I think it could get better just because I've seen it in other frameworks where it actually, you know, looks and watches for files that change and then compiles them and then reloads them. Right now, it basically makes you compile them and then reload your app, but it's certainly a nice developer experience. So Spring Boot 5, or Spring Framework 5, was released in September 2017. So, you know, that's like, what, four and a half years ago? It's been quite some time. Um, but it built on Reactor and the Reactive Stream specification and it include, included the new runtime of, you know, Spring Webflux. And so Spring Boot 2.0 added Webflux 
support and it was released March 1st, 2018. So it's been a few years, right? It seems like Spring 3, you know, Spring Boot 3 has taken a while, but it has, right? It's been almost three years and it's been, you know, very stable. And you know what I love about Spring Boot is like if you need to upgrade a project, chances are all you need to do is upgrade one version number, right? With like JavaScript projects, you need to upgrade like, you know, 10 dependencies in your package.json. But with Spring Boot, since it can manage your dependencies, it makes it so all, of, you know, most of the dependencies in your project don't even need version numbers. So that's super nice. And I get this question a lot. When would you use Spring WebFlex versus Spring MVC? And so there's a good quote that I read in one of like the comparison articles out there, and it says, performance differences are negligible unless you're doing a lot of API calls at scale of at least 500 requests per second, give or take. So up until 500 requests per second, it doesn't really matter. Spring MVC, Spring WebFlux, same performance. So for most folks, if you're building you know, a Volkswagen repair shop or something like that, uh, you're probably not going to need you know, massive scalability like Spring WebFlux, but for those customers that are running in Amazon, AWS, and are paying millions of dollars a month for their services because they're so popular, introducing something like Spring WebFlux can save them 30% right, of their bill. And if you're saving $300,000 a month, that might be a big deal. And so that's why you know, the Spring team invented it. They have a lot of you know, high profile, high traffic customers that are using it. And so it works really well for them. So I do like to compare the code. Sorry about that it's not so big, but if I made it big, then the lines would wrap and then it would be funny, right? But this is Spring MVC and you can see it's, it's pretty concise. This is from a JHipster app that I created called 21 Points. It's part of a book I wrote and the, the gist of it is you get points each day. So in this example, I'm creating points and it's just an object that I save in the database and then I save in the search repository for Elasticsearch so I can search on it later. And then I return a response entity because it's talking to a front end in Angular or React or whatever. And uh, I just want to return JSON, right? And so that's the Spring MVC version. And if you look at the Spring WebFlux version, what you get into is a lot of like reactive streams. And you know, you're doing a points repository.save and then you're flat mapping that into the you know, elastic search repository and then you're mapping the results and, and bringing it back. So as a developer, this isn't that easy to get used to, right? Because you have to chain everything together and figure out whether you use map or flat map and all that kind of stuff. So, you know, it can be difficult that way, but it does give you that raw performance that's a lot better. And so the MVC version is 14 lines of code. The WebFlux version, 22 lines of code. So that's almost, almost double, right? probably 30, 40% more. So you can see that there is a cost to being faster and implementing reactive programming. So an API gateway is an essential part of a microservices architecture as is service discovery, right? And so if you're doing Spring Cloud, you're probably using Eureka for service discovery. And if you were using you know, Spring Boot, I think 2.5 and below, you might've been using Zool for doing your, your routing or your gateway. And, uh, and so in JHipster, we basically implemented the reactive stuff on the back end so you could choose between Spring MVC or WebFlux. And then we went to the gateway part. And what we found is Spring Cloud at one point, I'm not sure the version, but they stopped supporting Zool, right? And so Zool was blocking, it wasn't reactive. They did have a Zool 2 version that was reactive, but Spring basically said, we're not gonna support it. We're going to write our own, right? We've had enough customer demand that we know that a gateway could be a thing that people really like. So they created Spring Cloud Gateway. And this is, uh, you know, a funny diagram because I wrote this for a blog post. And then someone from Volkswagen actually contacted me and said, how do you know that we architected our, you know, microservices that way? And I was like, man, this is a simple example. So you could probably morph it to whatever. But... You know, it's basically showing how you might implement a microservices gateway with OAuth for authentication. Anyway, what we came to at the end of like our implementation of reactive microservices was that we couldn't use Zool, right? Zool 1 was deprecated, Spring Cloud wasn't using it. They didn't support 2, so we had to use Spring Cloud Gateway. So we've had a lot of people really struggle with this when they develop a microservices architecture with JHipster, that they have to use Spring Cloud Gateway because they're like, I want to use Zool. And we're like, that's blocking. 
you want non-blocking architecture, right? So uh, Spring Cloud Gateway actually works really nicely for us. And just to explain a bit of security in this architecture, I wanted to talk a bit about the flow here. So you'll see what happens is the user requests cars, right? They talk to the car service, and then Spring Security will redirect them to log in to an identity provider like Okta. User authenticates, authorizes, comes back to the gateway, and then what the gateway does is it passes that JWT or that access token down to the downstream services. So that's how we've architected it in JHipster. It doesn't mean you have to architect it that way. You could use client credentials or something like that if you wanted to do service to service communication. But the problem with that is the downstream microservices wouldn't be able to see who the user is, right? And so by passing on that access token from the gateway, those downstream microservices can look up who the user is if they want. And so just to give a, a more simplified example of how OpenID Connect and OAuth works is how it used to be and what OAuth tried to solve was if you signed up for LinkedIn or you signed up for Yelp, at the end of that process, this is back in like 2006, they would prompt you for your username and password. And so people you know, probably entered their Gmail username and password and there was no guarantee that LinkedIn didn't store that information and use it again in six months. Right? And people like my parents are happy to put their username and password in anywhere, right? But we've learned a little more and we're like, I don't want to put my username and password in. I'll do it on Google, but I'm not going to do it anywhere else. And so OpenID Connect and OAuth came to solve that. And so what will happen now is instead of entering your connections, you'll click Connect with Google. You go to what's called an authorization server, right? Spring has an authorization server now, but it could be an IDP like Google. When I say IDP, I mean identity provider. Could be Auth0, could be Okta, anyone like that. Could be Keycloak. And you'll pass in a redirect URI that says, hey, after this works, come back to me, right? And you pass in some standard scopes of OpenID and profile. You get consent from the resource owner. The resource owner in this case is you that clicked on the button. You come back to that redirect URI with the authorization code. And then Yelp goes and exchanges that code for an access token and an ID token. And really, OIDC and OAuth are very similar. OIDC is just a thin layer on top of OAuth, and the main difference is if you're not using OIDC, you won't get that ID token, and therefore, you can't really identify the user, right? And so what happened is Google and Facebook, when they were first implementing all this, they actually implemented a way so you could get the user's information, and so that's how OpenID Connect came about, was like, hey, we need to have a way to get user information on top of OAuth. So they've been doing delegated authorization since 2012, and, uh, and there's one thing I really want to say, is if you have a choice between like OIDC and OAuth2 and SAML, choosing SAML is like choosing soap for your web services. Just don't do it, right? That shit was invented in like 2005, 2006. There's no reason to do SAML these days, just like there's no reason to do soap web services for the most part. So another important part of microservices is Docker and Kubernetes. And I'm not going to go into them that much, but I will generate the files that you can use to run in Docker or in Ku Kubernetes. And JHipster supports both. It also has a bunch of Kubernetes uh, like add-ons that I haven't even touched, like Scaffold and Knative and you know all that kind of stuff. So uh, what I'm going to show you in this demo today is creating a microservices architecture with JDL. And then we'll start Docker containers and use Gradle and show how everything works. And then we'll edit it to, uh, to switch from Keycloak, which is the default, to Okta. I'll show you how to make it work with Okta. Then we'll use Docker Compose to run it all. And then uh, maybe even do some end-to-end -end tests. So let's uh, get our mirroring back here. This is a, a mistake I commonly make, is I'll sit here and talk and like do the demo. And you guys just see like a screen that I'm not even showing. So if that happens before the end of this, just someone in the front row yell out and be like, hey, Matt, you're showing the wrong stuff. So I think we got everything going here. We can exit out of this one. And so what this did is it took a minute and 52 seconds. And I said I was going to show you what that JDL file looked like. So we'll open up IntelliJ and wait for it to index. Like, this is the worst part of IntelliJ, right? Waiting for it to index. Like, you don't mind much at work because you open it up and then you go grab a coffee or something, maybe use the restroom, right? You come back and it might be done. Right? But during a demo, you're like, oh man, when's it going to be done indexing? Right? Loading, loading. I, I do appreciate, though, that connecting to a projector is way better than connecting like via Zoom. 
because Zoom like slows down your screen, right? If you're presenting even more, so you're like, uh, this didn't take this long when I was at home, right? When I practiced this earlier. So we'll close all these areas here. And then I'll show you the, the JDL. So that's how we know we're hip is jhipster domain language, right? We have our own domain language here. So if we were to go up, there's an application configuration and we just specify the base name. This is for the gateway. Reactive is true. And so this is what people try all the time. They're like, I want to use Zool, right? And so that doesn't work. Even if you try it, like it's not going to work. Uh, then the package name, the application type is a gateway. And then OAuth2, you could use JWT if you wanted just as well. Sessions will not work, right? Because you're microservices, you're kind of, you know, trying to be stateless. Build tools, Gradle. I'm going to use Vue in this instance. And then Postgres for production. If you don't specify something, it uses a default. So it's going to use the dev instance of uh, H2. And then Eureka and test frameworks for Cypress. And then these are all the entities that are going to end up on the gateway. And then we have a blog microservice here with uh, Neo4j. And then down here we have a store which uses OAuth2 and MongoDB. So you'll want to make sure and use the same authentication type between your microservices or that's not going to work either. And then the store has a product and uh, the blog has, you know, blog, post, and tag. And then these are the entities. So, you know, a lot of times when I do Hibernate or JPA code, like it's tough for me to remember like how the relationships work and how the annotations work. So these are pretty simple because you don't, have to, you don't have to write getters and setters. But then down here, like the relationships is almost nice too. Many to one and, you know, many to many. You define them like that. And then some pagination rules. And then this down here is for Docker Compose. And so we can start up some Docker containers. I'll do it in this window so I can make it bigger. And this is the command I always forget. So I'm going to copy that one for later. I'll just put it in TextMate here. This problem with shutting everything down before you start up is like your apps take a while to start and you're like, why? Why are you taking so long? So there we go. And then uh, we'll go into the gateway and we're going to start the jhipster registry. I have a shortcut for that. jh registry up and jh key cloak up. And then docker ps to make sure those are the only ones starting. Uh, JH registry up. And there's also logs, right, is another shortcut that you can use. So these are all for OMIZSH, and you can go get the OMIZSH plugin for JHipster. And then we'll start this one up with Gradle W. Then we'll go into the blog, and that one's using Neo4j, so start that one. And then Gradle W that one. And then go into the store, and that one uses Mongo and Gradle W that one. So uh, the reason the gateway is going to take a while is because it does have all the front end code. And so this might be a mistake that you made at your company too. It took us a while to like realize it with jhipster, but guess what? We have this beautiful microservices architecture and we have a monolith UI, right? So if you ever actually deploy or change, you know, any of your entities on your microservice and the UI needs to change, you need to redeploy your gateway too. And that's kind of an anti-pattern, right? So micro front ends has recently come out and we do have support for it. I'm not going to demo it today because it's not fully complete and I've never demoed it in front of an audience before, so it would probably fail. Uh, but I will show you what the JDL looks like to do that. And the beauty of doing micro front ends is you actually end up with a UI on each microservice and you can actually start that microservice independently and operate on that UI. And then if you deploy them all together, the gateway will suck in the code from the microservices and that uses Webpack's module federation. So if we were to do this and localhost 8761, it'll redirect us to KeyCloak to log in. And so I don't know if you noticed, but <laughs> I love this warning from Chrome. This is telling me that admin admin is a bad username and password and they are right. So don't do that. But that's what we ship with by default. So you know, that's, uh, that's how we do the key cloak stuff. Um, you might not have noticed, and I don't know if it'll show. No, it doesn't. I have to log out and log back in. So up here is key cloak. So I actually had to define that in my Etsy host file. And that's the only way we figured out how to like make everything work within Docker is to have that key cloak there up there. So um, that's just something to, to know that you will need to do that. And then you can see that all of our apps are up and running so we can try localhost 8080 this is our gateway close that 
bump the fonts a little. I know, I know. And then uh, you know we can we can write a post, right? First post, it's always fun. At Spring I O, and it should have today's date. That would be cool if it just defaulted to that. But there we go. And we don't have any blogs or tags, but we can save it, and there it is. And then if we wanted to prove that the other microservice works, right? That's talking to uh, Mongo. We can do that here, and we'll get some sangria, and the price will be ten. And uh, hopefully I have an image here of Sangria. Let's see, I downloaded one the other day. There we are. So that looks kind of good, huh? Mmm. Are they just going to have beer tonight? Is there going to be Sangria there? Like, I hope there's Sangria. It's good stuff, right? And so everything's working now, right? We're, we're up and running, and we have all our microservices going. So the cool thing is with Cypress, if you were to go into the gateway directory, you can do npm run. E2E. And I won't run all these, but I just want you to show it firing up and, you know, making the initial requests and seeing how it logs in and stuff like that. And we actually talked to Keycloak's API to log in, so you never, like, see that screen or anything. So that's just some of them. If we did them all, it would take, you know, a couple minutes, so I won't make you watch that. But I did want to show you Docker Compose, right? So we'll close all these down, and we'll do dstop, which is an alias I have for stopping all the Docker containers. And then make sure there's nothing running, okay? And then we'll go back to our IDE here. And the first thing we're going to want to do is modify this application YAML to override the settings for Keycloak. So I have a shortcut for that called JHOIDC, and it'll take an issuer, a client ID, and a client secret. So with the uh, Okta CLI, which I have installed, I can actually create an app very easily. And we have JHipster support, so Okta apps create jhipster and it'll ask for a name reactive stack works for me it'll default to the redirect URIs right there's one for the uh, 8080 there for you know the gateway and one for 8761 for the registry so we'll just take those defaults and then if you go to production right you're obviously gonna have to modify your OIDC app to have new redirect URIs there's some application servers like or authorization servers like Keycloak that allow wild cards right, as you redirect URIs, uh, that is in OAuth 2.1 not going to be a thing. So even Okta, I think we added support for wildcards as well, but if you want to be like OAuth 2.1 spec compliant, there is no wildcards. You have to put them in there. So now you can see this is written to this file here, and that should show up on the left, and then I can grab the values out of that. And the reason we write it to a environment file instead of you know, putting it in like an application.yaml is you should never put secrets into your source code, right? Like, do a star.env for your git ignore and don't put them in there because that's, that's the first way to get in trouble. And I've actually, I've done it a lot, that's how I know. And I've gotten like emails from Amazon that's like, you just checked in your AWS secret key, right? And I'm like, oh, and then you gotta go rewrite your history and all that, it's a real pain. So we'll put that there. And so the beauty of Spring Boot and Spring Security is that's all I need to change to switch to you know, Okta. And if I want to switch to Auth0, it's the same. If I want to switch to Microsoft or some other identity provider, right? all you have to do is change those values. So now I can go into the Docker Compose directory. And I'll do this in another window so you can see it all. I just like the colors in this part. So downloads, reactive stack, Docker Compose, Docker Compose up. Oh, look at all those colors. And so you can do dash D, right? And it will, uh, it will, you know, run it in a daemon. But then you don't get to see all the colors, right? And it's nice to see like things starting up. Uh, this is also one of those things that if you don't have Docker configured correctly, like things won't start up, right? Because this is like 16 containers or something ridiculous like that. If I was to go, not here, but back to like containers and Docker Compose, yeah, one, two, three, four, five. Six, seven, eight. So it can take a lot of memory. And you notice we do have Keycloak here. I should have went and commented that out, right? We don't need this because we switched to Okta, but I just left it in there. And uh, and if you were to go, the, the thing I wanted to make a note of is you do need to like change your resources. So you can see I have eight CPUs, right? So this works in a demo. And 24 gigs of RAM. 
and you know three gigs of swap and disk size you know 128 so i think the default is like two cpus so if you actually do this you know on your machine without adjusting those like the store or mongo might fail to start so that's just you know something to realize and it is possible that you know if you were to make these into native images that maybe you wouldn't need to do that right because they use much less memory what i've seen with spring boot is it uses like 60 megs instead of like half a gig right when you're running as a native app instead of jvm mode so things are starting to start up here's the gateway we can look at a uh, localhost 8761 again that'll actually redirect octa now right and then i get a member of my username and password that's the hardest part please work yes so then you can see the blog and the store aren't quite up yet and we got this little you know every five seconds you can say to refresh okay the blog and the store but not the gateway the gateway is still chugging along back here come on you can do it let's try it maybe we'll get lucky 80 80 not yet I did see it starting back here there's the blog there's the store there you go right now the gateways up we can sign in there and the beauty of this one with keycloak we had to sign in twice but in this instance we're talking to the IDP and it's already got our session established so depending on internet right it'll come back and it'll say I'm already logged in come on you can do it this isn't Jay hipster this is internet right <laughs> maybe I don't know <laughs> I mean just trying to work back here Usually if it fails, it fails on the outbound, right? Not the, the incoming. Well, we can always see J Upster Registry has everything up. Oh, it doesn't have the gateway up. Oh, there it's coming back slowly. Did all of you get online and like do something at the same time here? We'll try, uh, we'll try an incognito window since that's always the one to trust, right? It will make us log in again, maybe. Hmm. Well, everything's up. We'll come back to that, right? It'll be up by the time we come back. So you can see uh, this whole example at Octadev Java Microservice Examples. And in fact, if we were to go click on that, there's a ton of examples in there because what I like to do is I like to show people bare bones and then I like to build it up. So you'll see I started with just Spring Boot and Spring Cloud. And then I started Spring Cloud Gateway showing how that works. And then I did the React, or just, this is regular J Hipster, right, with Spring MVC and then reactive jhipster and then i did one with kubernetes right so it shows how you can use kubernetes to go to the cloud with the same jhipster architecture come on gateway go baby are we on the right internet yep all right so i did like i said published a blog post on reactive microservices the spring cloud gateway this was like the first time I use Spring Cloud Gateway, and I really like it because for forwarding that JWT from the gateway to downstream microservices, it's like five lines of YAML. And if it was a properties file, it'd be one line, right? That damn YAML makes it five lines. But you just say use the token relay filter, and then it forwards your tokens down to the downstream services. So we covered, you know, JHipster, Spring Cloud, microservices, and Okta today. And I did, like I mentioned at the beginning, put all of this in a blog post. So it's got much more detailed explanations of each step, but it's there from 2021, uh, January. I did update it last uh, April, but all the code you saw today works just as well. And then Reactive Java and Kubernetes. I did a post where we actually deployed to Google Cloud with Kubernetes and everything worked great. And what I found out about Kubernetes that I really didn't know before I wrote this blog post was Kubernetes secrets are not secrets. So if you're using Kubernetes secrets, it's like a terrible name. You know what it is? It's a base 64 encoded string. So you can copy that string, go to any browser and unencode it, and there's your secret, right? And so as part of this blog post, I was like, that's not good, right? And what I recommend is like using something like HashiCorp Vault, which now JHipster Registry has support for. I haven't played with it yet. But in this particular blog post, what I use is sealed secrets which is a great project where you can actually encrypt your secrets so you can even check them into source control on GitHub and as long as no one has that key, 
right, you're good to go. So I encourage you to check out that project. We do have some other posts on deploying to Azure, this same app, and we have one coming up on DigitalOcean. And so what I found with all of those is you struggle just like Docker does if you don't have the right size of machine. And so I think, you know, a lot of that's just Spring Boot and the JVM in general. And, you know, as we get more native images, you know, when we have native support for our microservices, then that might be something where you can use the smallest image that they provide and everything will work. But, you know, what I've, what I've done is, you know, I've learned to expense like the $10 that it takes me to even QA like a post on Google Cloud just because I can use the faster instances and everything works. And so you might be asking, what about Kotlin, right? You talked about Java microservices, but people are very interested in Kotlin. So the cool thing is, is we have a blueprint in JHipster for Kotlin. So blueprints was something we introduced about three or four years ago that allows you to override specific behavior, right? So instead of Java, it's a Kotlin backend, right? Instead of Spring Boot, you can actually do Micronaut, or you can do Quarkus, or you could do <gasps> Node, or you can do .NET. So I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Other people wrote them, I didn't write them. All right, I do help support them. But on the front end, we even have Svelte support now. And we have Spring Native support. So with Blueprints, we've added all those features without actually modifying the base project, right? So that's pretty slick. And you might be asking, what about Loom? Right, so reactive programming, you might look at it and say, you know, he had 22 lines versus 14 lines. I'd much rather write the 14 lines of code, right? And so will Loom allow me to write 14 lines of code instead of 22? I can't really answer that question, but from what I've seen for the most part, we shouldn't care about Loom. Spring, those guys will care about it. They'll fix it, right? Tomcat, right? Like, if they want to be faster than Netty, they have to, you know, embrace Loom and be faster that way. So I do think we will see a lot of advances. But what I've learned about reactive programming is just the whole, like, streams API model where you're, like, chaining stuff and flat mapping and all that kind of stuff. That is useful to know. So that's why I recommend, you know, take a look at reactive programming, learn it, learn it with Spring Boot. And JHipster is, is great for that because, you know, you can generate the code and you don't have to know it and it all works. So you can just, you know, do it that way. So people might be asking what's next for JHipster. So these are my personal interests. And because Okta is a platinum sponsor at JHipster, I get to pay people to actually implement them. So if you have something that you would like to see in JHipster, talk to me, buy me a sangria tonight, and you know I'll put a bug bounty on it and we'll get it in the project. So Spring Native is something that Josh and I worked on all the way from last September, where we actually met and like hacked together for a day and took some JHipster apps and made it all work. And then we get, did it again in December of last year, and then we turned it into a blueprint just like a month or two ago. So it took a, you know, a couple of months to turn it into a blueprint, but now if you install the JHipster native blueprint, instead of typing JHipster, you type JHipster native, and then your app will run as a native app, or you can compile it to a native executable and run it, and it starts up in you know, 500 milliseconds instead of 20 seconds or whatever. So that's pretty slick. The micro front ends is another thing that we've worked on, and it is in there. Let me see if uh, I can open up a project. Gateway, you're still going? Damn you. Give it one more try. And then I'll open up this other project here that I have just to show you the difference. Uh, this one here. So I have two JDLs in here, Reactive MS and MF. And there's micro front ends is the MF one. And so you'll see, I just have a different client framework, right? But that doesn't really matter. The difference is this micro front ends line, right? It's saying, hey, pull in the entities and the data from those microservices instead of putting it all on the main gateway like this one. So everything else is pretty much the same, but I did find that for the microservices, if I wanted to run Cypress on them, I did have to install Cypress in that microservice. And then, you know, it would use the client framework and all that. And so I think this, uh, it doesn't support like mixing and matching because why would you use like Node and Spring Boot and .NET together, right, for your microservices? That's crazy, right? So micro front ends, we have the same philosophy that you're probably going to want one framework for your front end and not three, just to be cool, you know? Even though I did it with the databases, sorry about that, right? I had Mongo and Postgres and all that. And then I also wanted to show you this Kubernetes JDL, which, which defines how you can generate a Kubernetes architecture. You can also go into this demo here. And if we were to go in 
to the root directory and do like uh, take k8s and then jhipster k8s. Got to spell it right. It'll prompt you for a number of different things like what type of application, microservice. You say the root, you say the apps you want, and then do you want Prometheus? No. Uh, we'll cluster our databases. We'll use admin because we're bad. And then we'll use like a uh, demo for the Kubernetes namespace. And then my Docker name is mrabel, Docker push, no Istio, load balancer. Uh, we'll do some dynamic storage. And then it generates all the YAML for us that we need for Kubernetes. So that's the worst part of Kubernetes is the YAML, right? So jhipster does that for you. And you can always just look at the code, right? You don't have to actually, you know, implement it. I did see some action back here with the logs, but you know what I think the problem was? So remember I copied this Gradle command to build the Docker container? I never built the Docker containers, right? So I did build them earlier, so that's how some of them worked, but yeah, oh well. That's how you know it was real, a real demo, right? Parts of it failed. <laughs> and then as far as uh, GraphQL, we have an open issue for that. Actually, it's a closed issue because no one's implemented, but it is a personal interest in mine, and now that you know we have GraphQL for spring, I think that could move along nicely. So like I said, jhipster is knowledge. Just try generating an app and looking at it. Even if you want to write tests, most of jhipster apps have 70 to 75% test coverage. So that's huge, right? Even for the JavaScript or the TypeScript files, we don't do JavaScript, we just do TypeScript. So it's a great way to see how to test your front end code, test your back end code, and it all works nicely. I did write a book on it, it's super out of date, don't download it, but I am working on a new version. Um, and since I like to dumb things down and make it easy, I also got complaints from people that are like, Jay Hipsters, how do I learn just the building blocks? So I wrote this book, the Angular mini book, written with ASCII Doctor. You can download it for free from InfoQ, uses Angular 13 and Spring Boot 2.6, um, even does Kotlin on the back end and Spring Security and shows you how to use all that. And then it shows you how to deploy them as separate apps. So you might have your front end on Firebase and your back end on Heroku. And then it shows you how to put them all in the same jar and deploy them like jhipster does. So you can learn more. Spring Boot's guides are excellent. jhipster.tech if you want to learn more about jhipster. If you want to learn about Okta's APIs, we're at developer.okta.com. And Stack Overflow is my lead developer on my team, so I encourage you to hire them for your team as well. You can read our blog. We have lots of posts on there. And our Twitter and our GitHub handle is all at OctaDev. And my action for you is to try jhipster. NPM install it. I got some stickers up here for you. And also, we have coffee downstairs. I don't know if you've seen, but if you want a cappuccino or a latte, Okta's got that booth down there. So use the source, Luke. And may the auth be with you. Thank you for coming. <laughs>